students, welcome to this lecture on VLSI design KEC 072. I am Dr. Raman Kapoor, Associate Professor at ABS Engineering College, Ghaziabad. Today we are going to start with a very interesting topic of random access memories, namely two of them SRAM and DRAM. So, let us get started. Uh, in our last lecture, we studied about read only memory or ROM and we studied NOR and uh, NAND based implementation of random or uh, sorry read only memory. Read only memory or ROM is a non volatile memory. So, once you have written the data that remains in the system even if power is turned off. Okay. Today, we want to study the, the counterpart of the non volatile memory which is the random access memory which is a type of a volatile memory. Okay. So, as long as we have applied sufficient power, you can do your read and write operations right? and once the power is turned off, you might have to repeat the process again once the power is back on. Okay. So, this is uh, basically the start for random access memory. We generally deal with two types of random access memory, one is known as a static version or SRAM. Another is the dynamic version which is the dynamic random access memory or DRAM. So, let us start with what is an SRAM. The S in SRAM stands for static as you can read on the slide. Uh, any memory circuit is said to be static if the stored data can be retained indefinitely. Okay. So, once you have written something, it remains there unless you overwrite it and keep in mind that we are talking about digital operations. So, whatever we are reading or writing is in terms of zeros and ones. So, if you have written zeros and ones in a series of SRAM circuit, that data remains there. Obviously, you have to keep the power on, but that data remains there until you overwrite it. So, there is no uh, the concept or the, the possibility of leaking of data is very minimal. Okay. You can safely say that the data does not leak away. So, if you have written a 1, that does not decay to 0 on its own. Okay. So, it remains static, it remains there. The data storage cell that is the 1 bit memory cell in static RAM arrays, it consists of your simple uh, latch circuits which has two stable operating points and as I said we are talking about digital operations, these stable operating points are your logic 0 and logic 1. Okay. If you remember in one of our previous lectures not very long ago, we have uh, studied about flip flops uh, as a storage element, how they work, how they operate that was from the circuit point of view. In that we started our discussion with what is known as a bistable latch. Okay. Latch is something which latches on to a piece of data and bistable means a circuit which has two stable states 0 and 1. That bistable element if you remember the circuit we had two cross coupled inverters Okay. So, if you apply a 1 here, you would get a 0 here which is fed back to another inverter. So, you get 1 again. Okay. So, this end you can consider as Q and this end you can consider as Q bar, two outputs which are complementary to each other. Okay. So, suppose if you are if you are reading 1 or if you have stored a 1 here that one remains here, this 0 remains here, the data is latched onto. This bistable latch element forms the basis for your static random access memory. This you can consider as a starting point for your SRAM analysis. Okay. Now, this is again that cross coupled inverter only, okay. the only addition you can see in this bistable latch is that you have two access columns here. Okay. These are known as your access columns. So, you can access the data if you want to read something which you have already stored okay. or if you want to write something which you want to store, you can do via access columns. These are also known as your bit lines sometimes abbreviated as BL. Uh, for ease of operation, for noise immunity and for many other reasons, you actually do not have one bit line or one access column. 
you have a pair of them and the pair is complementary to each other. So, you can have a bit line C here and you have a bit line C bar here. Okay? So, they both are going to be complementary to each other, right? it comes in a pair. To access the data contained in the memory cell, so this is your memory cell, this becomes your memory cell, okay? cross coupled inverter. To access the data which is contained in this memory cell via the bit line, you need at least one switch which is controlled by the corresponding word line. Okay. So, you will have a line of voltage, okay. if you activate it, you have activated your bit line via the word line okay. and that word line basically tells you the address or the location of the data and whatever you want to read or write can be, be uh, if you want to read something, you can access it from the bit line if you want to write something, you can put it on the bit line. Okay. Usually as I have said, you have two complementary access switches consisting of NMOS pass transistors. Okay. They are implemented okay, and to connect the one bit SRAM cell to the complementary bit lines or you can also call them columns. So, this complete circuit which you are seeing here, this arrangement, now your memory design, your memory circuits have come a long way. There are lot of memory circuits you can come across, uh, there are hundreds of varieties in which you can implement storage elements, but this basically this arrangement which you are seeing on the screen, this, cons this is considered as a starting step. Okay. This is how you latch onto the data and you read the data and you access the data or you override the data. Okay. So, this becomes your starting point. This circuit, now we are moving a bit towards the CMOS arrangement of things this generic structure okay, of the static RAM or SRAM MOS type SRAM cell is shown. It consists of two cross coupled inverters, you can see M 1, M 2 form one inverter, M 3, M 4 form the second inverter and they are cross coupled. Okay. So, this output here Q is sent here as input, the output here is sent as input here. Okay. So, the output of one is serving as input to another and vice versa. So, M 1, M 2 one inverter, M 3, M 4 another inverter, four of these transistors put together form one pair of cross coupled inverter or a bistable latch circuit. Okay. Plus, you have two more excess transistors M 5 and M 6, okay, which are connected to what is known as the bit line and bit line bar. Okay. So, the circuit you can see now is similar to the arrangement we have just discussed in the previous slide. You have cross coupled inverters for your memory element or memory cell followed by a pair of excess transistors or excess switches, your transistor is also a switch. Okay. For accessing data whether to read or write, you use another pair of pass transistors. These are usually enhancement type n channel MOSFETs. Okay. So, you can see this complete arrangement can be used for storing one bit of data or it can also be used for reading one bit of data. Okay. And this is also known as commonly known as the 60 SRAM cell, 60 means 6 transistors. If you count the number of transistors, each inverter needs 2 transistors, so you have 2 inverters. So, that makes 4 transistors and you have 2 excess transistors also. So, in total you have 6 transistors for storing or reading of 1 bit of data. This arrangement is known as 60 SRAM cell. Now, let us just see how you can basically uh, do the reading and writing and how you can implement it in a circuit itself. Okay. This is your CMOS implementation of static random access memory. The major advantages being it offers very low static power consumption, it has good noise margin, the switching speed is very decent enough. Okay. The only disadvantage is that it takes a lot of area, we will find an alternative to that also, okay. but let us just focus on the SRAM cell for now. Okay. So, see these transistors M 1, M 5 that is one inverter for you, M 2, M 6 that is one inverter for you. The output of this inverter is being fed as input here and the output is being coupled here. Okay. So, they are cross coupled. 
you have m 3 and m 4 these are your excess transistors. Okay. So, m 1, m 5, m 2, m 6 these are your cross coupled inverters. Okay. This form your cross coupled inverter cell your so called storage element. Okay. It has two stable states, so it can store either a 0 or a 1 m 3 m 4 become your excess transistors. Okay. These are used for your access. Okay. While reading you want to access the data, while writing you want to put the data through. Okay. So, these m 3 and m 4 are your doors to your memory cell. Okay. They are your access doors to the memory cell. In addition you can see here you have one transistor here and you have one transistor here. Both are p type they are these are PMOS transistors. The gate is always grounded, so they are always on right. These two capacitances capacitive nodes are always charged to VDD. Okay. So, when this is on this is charged to VDD. So, you have a VDD here and you have VDD. Okay. These are going to help you during your reading and writing times. right? So, let us just see this is this complete arrangement and this is your word line here. So, you put the this is for accessing your data okay? and whatever you want to uh, write also you can put it here and that uh, basically allows you to uh, access the memory cell. Okay? So, any, any row address decoder is going to allow you to operate the word line. The word line basically turns on the bit line, the bit line does the read and write part okay, and the memory cell stores it. Right. So, let us see how the read operation works. Okay. Suppose, this is one of the output node, let us call it q and let us call this node 2 as q bar. Okay. Suppose, 1 is already present here, okay. logic 1 is present here and I want to read this data if 1 is present here, this is provided to this point. Okay. Sorry. Let us just say that q is 0, okay. not 1, but 0. Let us just say that this point node 1, okay. so it is written 1 here, but this is node number 1. This is not logic 1, this is node number 1. Node number 1 is 0 here okay. and node number 2 is logic 1 here, because they are complementary to each other. This is coupled here, this is coupled here cross coupling. What it does is it makes this m 1 on and it makes m 6 on. Okay. So, now m 1 is on and m 6 is on, m 5 is off and m 2 is off. So, the ones which are highlighted in bold they are on the ones which are dotted are they are actually off. Okay. Now, this capacitance and this capacitance both are charged to VDD, so they are at logic 1. right? Suppose, I want to read this, right? I apply VDD here, I apply VDD here to M 3 and M 4 my excess transistors, they are NMOS, so they turn on. Now, M 3 is a closed switch, M 4 is a closed switch, there is a path available, okay. but now see there is logic 1 here and there is logic 1 here and there is a closed switch in the middle. So, between this point node 2 and this CC bar there is no voltage difference, there is no potential difference. Okay. So, there can be no uh, exercise or no process of charging or discharging at this point, but if you look at this point this end CC this node is at logic 1, this node 1 is at logic 0 there is a potential difference between them. Okay. So, this node and switch this m 3 is also on. right? So, this node C C starts to discharge, it starts to discharge here okay. and while it is discharging okay, at some point of time the, the voltage across this C C is going to reduce, but the voltage across C C bar is going to remain same at logic 1 these two voltages will then be passed on to a comparator circuit uh, some kind of a differential amplifier which compares the difference of 
two terminals okay, and gives an output which is an amplified, amplified form of the difference. Okay. So, if this voltage, voltage across E c goes down, it basically means that a logic 0 was stored there at, at node 1. Okay. That differential amplifier via its output is going to tell you that a logic 0 was present here, because it is it, the output of that comparator is going to observe a drop here, a drop in the voltage across capacitor C C. Okay. If the opposite was true, if a 1 was here and a 0 was here, the same process would happen at this node. So, the comparator's output will be opposite in this case. Okay. So, you can have a comparators designed in such a way which measure the drop in voltage across this node or this node. If the voltage across this capacitor drops to 0, it means a 0 was stored. If the voltage across this node drops to 0, it means a 1 was stored here. This is basically what is happening, a reading cycle is happening. A logic value was stored inside the latch and you are just trying to extract that voltage. Okay. And how you are doing it? Basically, you would depending upon the, the data stored either m here m 1 and m 6 was on, if 1 was stored here and 0 was stored here m 5 and m 2 will be on. Okay. Either way initially you will start with logic 1 here, logic 1 here, this will be on, this will be on to provide access okay. and you will observe the voltages across capacitive nodes C c and C c bar. If the voltage across C c discharges to 0, there was a 0 stored if the voltage across C c bar discharges to 0, there was a 1 stored. This is how you do the read and write operation sorry read operation in a static RAM cell. Okay. Now, let us just see how the write operation happens. Okay. Suppose a 1 was stored here and you want to overwrite it to 0. Okay. So, initially let us call this node Q, it is holding 1, this is Q bar, it is holding a 0. Okay. I want to overwrite this 1 to a 0, I want to do the write operation. If this is 1, m 2 will be on, if this is 0, m 5 will be on. Okay. So, in this case m 5, m 2 are on right, and m 6 and m 1 are on. Right. Now, I want to write a 0, so that 0 must be present somewhere, that should be available to me. Okay. Whatever I want to write, that should be available somewhere. So, this column here C, I am going to make it 0 volt, I am going to connect it to 0, okay, logic 0. This C bar remains at VDD. Okay. Now, I have applied VDD at the gate terminals of my excess transistors M 3 and M 4. So, they are on, they are providing me access. Okay. So, slowly and steadily what will happen? I have a 1 here, I have a 0 here. I have a 0 here, I have a 1 here. Okay. Because this m 2 is on, this q bar always remains 0, even though there is a potential difference here, this q bar remains at 0 here, but what happens here, there is no path here right now. Okay. This bar starts to discharge to this ground. Okay. This node 1, the q equal to 1, it starts to discharge here to 0. Once this starts to discharge, okay, at some point of time m 2 is going to turn off when threshold voltage is exceeded on the downside. Okay. So, when q is discharging at some point of time it is going to go below the threshold of m 2. At that time m 2 is going to turn off, when m 2 turns off, right? if m 2 turns off here, right? that is going to do the opposite of that m 2 turns off, right? now there is a path here, right? now this can get connected to 1 here, q bar will become 1. Okay. Earlier what was happening, m 2 was on, so q bar was connected to ground here, it was able to discharge, it was at logic 0. Slowly when q starts to discharge via this c, at some point of time it is going to go below the threshold of m 2, m 2 turns off when m 2 turns off this one this is on gets connected to 2 q bar switches take some time switches to logic 1 when this switches to logic 1 m 5 goes off okay and m 1 
turns on right when m1 turns on this is a cross coupled stage okay so when q bar goes 1 q goes to 0 otherwise also you can see when m2 goes off here this point was coupled here m5 is now off this has discharged so this is off okay and this part here this is going to turn on okay either way m1 is going to go on when m1 goes on there is a path anyways q has discharged okay anyways q has discharged via c okay and whatever scope was left it provides a path here towards ground so now q goes to zero so what is happening earlier i had a logic 1 present now logic 0 is present so what i have done i have overwritten the data right so i have provided logic 0 at q and have provided logic 1 at q bar my so called complementary outputs in a bistable latch circuit this is how your write operation works in a sram static ram okay so you have done both you have done the uh, the read operation and you have done the write operation in a static random access memory cell right let's proceed further now see the counterpart of sram which is known as dram or dynamic random access memory the circuit which we have seen till now in the previous slide it is quite a good circuit it is easy to understand easy to implement quite good switching very less power consumption but there is one drawback you need at least six transistors to read or write one bit of data now modern memories are running into like mbs gigabytes terabytes and so on okay and if you want that much amount of memory density that much amount of circuit density for implementing storage you can't have six eight or that many transistors for implementing one bit of storage so you need some alternative to that right to satisfy these area related requirements instead of statically or permanently storing the data why not store the binary data across a capacitor what does a capacitor do it is just a, a means or a or a component for storing of charge okay if you store a one across it it holds that data for some time it might discharge also okay but if you keep refreshing it it stores that one so a dynamic ram or a dynamic random access memory cell is going to store the data okay in the form of a capacitor right so data is stored as a capacitor if data is present that is logic 1 if it is grounded it is logic 0 right so instead of uh, storing that data in a static way you are doing it in a dynamic way via capacitor that is why the word dynamic random access memory okay these are some of the ways how you can implement dynamic random access memory okay this version which you see on top left is known as 4t dram or 4 transistor now this one does not offer a lot of area advantage because you already had 60 SRAM, 6 transistors. Now you can use 4 transistor for DRAM that is a, sm uh, a small uh, improvement on area but not a big one. Okay. Another one is 3T, 3 transistor DRAM okay. and the best possible advantage you can get in terms of area is what is known as a 1T or 1 transistor dynamic random access memory which is nowadays has become an industry standard also. Okay. And here you can see that you have a capacitor also, you have one capacitor here, you have one capacitor here, you have another capacitor here. Okay. So, in all these three circuits the number of transistors might vary, but the constant thing is that the there is a presence of a capacitor in a 4T DRAM or 3T DRAM circuit you have what is known as your parasitic capacitances. The parasitic capacitance can be across the gate the input capacitance or it can be the diffusion capacitance between the drain and substrate junction. Okay. These are your parasitic capacitances they are inbuilt they are always present in any MOS circuit. But a 1T DRAM structure it has an explicit storage capacitor you would have to specifically design a physical capacitor and external capacitor explicitly for implementing one transistor DRAM cell. Okay. In the other two versions 4T and 3T versions the parasitic capacitances are already present and they help you to store charge which you can read or write. Okay. So, you, for example, you can see here this is your storage transistor 
this is your right axis, this is your read axis. Okay? So, this is right axis, this is read axis. If this capacitor is discharged, it means it is holding 0. If this capacitor is charged, it means it is holding 1. Okay? That 1 can be accessed from the read line. If this is 1, this transistor is on, you can read. Okay? If it is 0, then also you can have select lines to read the data. For the right select line, you can use that for uh, overwriting data which might have been written earlier. Okay? So, the major difference in these three DRAM structures is the first which you can observe is number of transistor, second is uh, the, the how the capacitor is present in the DRAM cell. Okay? So, here you have you need an, an external capacitor, but in the other two version you can do with the parasitic version. Okay? Now, since we are talking about area advantages, so let us just focus on the 1 T 1 transistor DRAM structure only. Okay? because uh, if you are if you are using six transistor in the sram structure for storing one bit of data here you are using only one transistor okay so that is the best area advantage you can get so let's see the structure you have this transistor m1 which is your storage transistor you can call okay you have a read write select line here okay which is connected to the gate terminal of m1 this is your storage capacitor c1 is your storage capacitor and C 2 here is what is known as a column capacitor, okay, which is a parasitic capacitor. Now, the idea here is the value of C 2 has to be much, much higher than C 1. C 1 is generally is of the order of few tens of femtofarad, okay. femto is 10 to the power minus 15. So, that is a very small value. C 2 on the other hand has to be very high, it can go up to microfarads also. Okay. So, the value of C 2 should be very high as compared to C 1 and this fact, this factor here, this difference of capacitive value is what is central to the working of a DRAM cell. Okay? So, let us just see how the reading and writing is happening. If you are trying to write something, you just put this terminal as equal to 1. Okay? Put this terminal equal to 1 the gate uh, turns on, okay. the gate turns on, whatever you have here can be transited here. Okay. So, there is a some kind of a sharing takes place. Okay. Whatever is present, right, you can pre read it from here, whether it is a 0 or a 1 when this switch is on. When you are trying to write, how you see the writing like reading is pretty straightforward you turn m1 on and see what is the voltage across c1 if there is no voltage logic 0 is there if a high voltage is there logic 1 is there okay that is the that is how you do the reading part across a dram sorry that is how you can do the writing part sorry if you put this equal to 1 you can turn this on and you can charge or discharge your capacitor via the data input here. Put a 0 here, it gets charged to 0, put a 1 here, <coughs> it gets charged to 1. Okay. This is the right operation. Okay. Turn m 1 on, put your data on data line, data in or out, this gets connected to C 1 if a 0 is present here c 1 goes to 0, if a 1 is present here c 1 goes to 1, this is how you write. Okay. If you want to do the reading part, okay. now reading is slightly complicated because it is a destructive method, whatever is already there while you are trying to read it, it will get lost. Okay. So, you have to refresh it again, the read cycle of a 1 T DRAM is a destructive cycle. Okay. So, what will happen is whatever you are trying to read forget about this data in or data out you have to put this as on. So, you put one here this becomes on. Now, you see this node is connected to this node. Okay. Two capacitors connected in such a way one is a very high value one is a very low value. Suppose 
a zero was here so sum of the charge will go here okay now the value of c1 is very less c2 is very large so it will store a lot of charge and a very small amount of charge will go here okay so if a small decrease happens in the value of voltage across c2 it means a zero was stored here vice versa if a one is there and when m1 is on based on charge sharing a small amount of charge will go from c1 to c2 so the voltage across c2 will go slightly up this slight increase in the voltage across c2 means that logic 1 was stored here okay so if the voltage across c2 goes down slightly it means a zero is being read if the voltage across c2 goes up slightly it means a one is being read this is how read cycle is done but now what is happening here if a zero was present some voltage comes here and it becomes one because the value of capacitance is very small if a one was present here it goes here and it becomes a zero because it was holding a small amount of charge either way if you are reading a zero it gets converted to one if you are reading a one it gets converted to zero that is why the read cycle is called as a destructive cycle when you are trying to read data from a dynamic ram cell the data is basically lost okay so zero gets converted to one one gets converted to zero so you have to do a periodic refreshing of data also okay so with this we come to the end of today's lecture we have discussed a very important topic of random access memory and we have discussed two types of memories sram and dram okay we have done the working we have seen how reading and writing operations take place and we have done a comparison also okay and with this we can say that with area requirements taking the forefront dynamic ram cells tend to get used more than sram okay thank you